Hi, I'm Robert Ritchie, and this is Bentley. You knew I was going to do this, right? So that's my buddy. All right, my buddy. Okay, he's got to go. I go. He'll probably be. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for watching my presentation outline. This is for the final paper for our class for the uh, gender and genocide in the 20th century, taught by Professor Dr. Jennifer Marlowe, offered through Gratz College in Melrose Park, Philadelphia. Today is Friday the 12th. What I'm going to do today is really walk you through the outline, and I have to apologize ahead of time. Taping this has become much more ambitious of a project than I thought, and of course, as I'm getting a lot of some of this information, or a good part of it for the first time, I don't have it committed to memory, so I'll have to refer to my notes periodically, and so I, uh, I beg your forgiveness ahead of time. What I would like to do is a couple of different things. I want to start by telling you uh, what were the triggers for me on this the particular topic that I've chosen, and I'll tell you what that is in a little bit. Uh, then I'll also cover what I am not going to cover so much in the paper uh, because I believe in some respects what we leave out or don't include is could be and is as important as what we might be including all right and then I'll go through some of the key points for the paper the larger ones and then some of the sub points uh, it's basically this is still a living document what I have I've got the bones together you know I'm attaching the sinews right and it's like what I mean it's in process right again I'm adding more flesh to it all the time so here's what I'd like to do um, some of the the, the um, hmm. let me let me tell you this first of all there was no title to the paper either right it's uh, to be determined but the topic itself is the erroneously referred to as a euthanasia program and it really it really what we could call it is a Nazi euthanasia program and what I have we are leaning towards the children uh, now of course the term has been abused uh, by the Nazis because there was nothing merciful about the death it was basically a lie and a way to camouflage the murdering disabled uh, people so um, that's the topic in itself now what were the triggers for me personally? Um, it came about by reading uh, an, an essay by um, Hugh Gregory Gallagher in his uh, uh, in uh, Toten and Parsons' Century of Genocide, and in that book, uh, his essay rather, he talks about uh, he gives a really interesting number. He says that in 1939 there were 300,000 disabled people living in Germany. By 1940. Six, there were only forty thousand remaining. That's thirteen. That's about thirteen percent, which means, in round numbers, eighty-seven percent were annihilated. Okay, and I, even though I don't like making this particular comparison or contrast, and because it's not, a, it may not be appropriate, but just to give you an idea of something, if these people that were killed. This 87% represented a community. Um, and let's say they represented one of the Jewish communities in, in Europe. They would have ranked just behind Poland and depending on whose information you go to, tied for second place with Greece. Um, the reason I say that is because um, the Yad Vashem in the numbers of, re, of surviving, um, uh, the amount of surviving Jewish people per country and uh, have one set of numbers, uh, two actually, there's a range, but the Museum of Tolerance uses the higher end of that range. So even figure on the higher end, they would be right there with Greece. That's a lot of people percentage wise. And uh, when I get into another component of the paper, I'll give you a little bit of a definition why I think that's important. So um, that, that was one of the reasons. Uh, another reason that I've gravitated towards the subject is because there are some nuances I've discovered within my uh, research that are gonna help me with whether I go to uh, my thesis paper or whether I do a project. But I did find some things in here that are going to be incredibly valuable to some things that I'm discovering about uh, not only the Holocaust but the uh, genocide as well. Um, another trigger, I think that is that the trigger of the topic? Uh, Dr. Jennifer Marlowe's, uh, actually one of her comments uh, was another trigger when she was quoting Scott and said that, uh, here, and I've got it right here, says, gender is a social category that is imposed on a sex body. And I, I really believe we could make a, a good case that the uh, mentally disabled of Germany as a gender um, 
a forced um, would be, could, could be considered a, a, a gender side. But I'll get into that as I get into some other reading to support that. And then the final trigger for me was my previous volunteer work that I've done with disabled adults and, and disabled children. So um, what, uh, what am I not going to cover? And I'm, I'm really struggling with this particular point as well. The perpetrators. I've got to include the perpetrators, and I do, and what they're responsible for, but how much weight do you put towards the perpetrators compared to the victims? And I really want to focus on the victims, especially the memory of the victims. Then um, I'll, when I get into the memory section of the paper, which is the next component, um, you you'll, may understand why. So um, here's what happened during this time. Um, You've got scientists, you've got uh, physicians, psychiatrists. They're really responsible for a lot of what's going on here with all this, these atrocities with, this, with the racial hygiene and this master race. And there's also a new breed of scientists that develops. It's the statistician, right? All of a sudden, their role is elevated and they become really important people. Uh, the analogy that I use... Uh, they become the carry-on of, of their day, right, from Dante's Inferno. And the whole idea of social politics, you can call it the river of social politics, because the river becomes the river of um, Acheron, right? Because basically what they're doing and whatever numbers they're manipulating or lists that they're making, because they were big list fanatics, um chaperone someone from life to death in, in many cases but I, I do have to include them but I, I do struggle with it um, and also another reason why I struggle is because many of these perpetrators they received a lot of their accolades these acolytes received a lot of their accolades when they were during the war when they were committing these atrocities and after the war and even after their death um, let me give an example. There's a, one particular killing site where they celebrated the death and cremation of the 10,000 body. And the format of the celebration was basically a, a drunken bacchanale. It was horrible. Um, the other thing is you get folks like, um, I don't want to pronounce his name correctly, um, Julius Halvervoten and his infamous brain collection. His collection of brains was being used for research by the Max Planck Institute of Brain Research up until 1990. So it, this is not an abusive ad hominem towards these scientists, but um, after doing the research, uh, I, I'm, I guess the way I could put it would be to plagiarize in some respects what Martin Luther said, um, my conscience is held captive by my research, okay? I cannot uh, give these scientists more due than I feel is they're worthy of in this moment. So, um, that's, my, that's my take on with the scientists, but I do have to include them. I do something that's a little unusual with the paper. In a lot of studies, um, when we get into memory work, we sort of end with the memory work. But what I do is I sort of I use them as bookends. As I uh, finish with memory work, but I also start with some stuff about at least memory and, and work and some comments. But let me read you two in particular. Okay, the first one is again, it's by Hugh Gregory Gallagher, who himself was no stranger to disabilities. At the age of 19, he uh, contracted polio and spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. And the second quote that I'm going to offer is by uh, Henry Friedlander. Uh, Gallagher says this about the victims. So the victims were chronically mentally ill mentally retarded and severely disabled, struggling to survive in time of war. It is not surprising that there are no memoirs. And then uh, Henry Feelander's comment. Few, if any, details about the lives, sufferings, and deaths of individual victims about that we have. About some victims, we know almost nothing. About some victims, we know only what someone else remembered about them. 
We can only guess, we can only assume, we can only wonder. That's what he said. To me, that was incredibly moving. And, uh, and that's why I wanted to bring that to the very beginning. Because there's very little that was done up until recently. And I'll discuss that uh, when I get down to a, a couple of sections later. So with any study on uh, Nazism, at least for me, I've got to start with and include something about the uh, ideology. And I do. Uh, I, I talk about uh, the, what was happening in society at the time. Uh, what was happening certainly in terms of with, with race. And, um, and also how those were manifested through propaganda. Uh, we heard of probably about the textbook exercises with formulas and math books and stuff about the cost of retaining someone or caring for someone that's in one of these facilities. But the other thing that uh, what I like in particular is um, the films because there were some... You can see it just manifests. There's some incredibly horrible films that were made. Um, and uh, it's interesting when we look at these films on these folks with these uh, of, of the handicapped and the way they're portrayed in the films. It's not fair. Of course, it's all doctored the way they do this, a lot of shadowing. But um, it, it's interesting to watch that and then in light of Lenny uh, Riedmerstahl's um, uh, Olympia or Olympiad. It's a really interesting contrast. So um, I do talk about ideology and some other components as well. But what I'm saying is because this will not be comprehensive. The other thing I do, there's dates, facts, and figures, right, um, that we have to study. But my comment about the dates, facts, and figures are, um, it's, it's, it's interesting in this case because we look at how many infants and uh, young children were murdered during this uh, euthanasia campaign that actually didn't end until after um, later in May or maybe even July for children anyway uh, there is a case reported I'll talk about that in my paper about after uh, the unconditional surrender was accepted there was uh, still killings going on and included children as well but um, 5,000 is the number we have, approximately. It's very difficult to, you know, to try to put something concrete on it. And that number can get lost when we look at the grand scheme of um, the deaths, of course, associated with World War II. Um, but there's much more to it. We can't measure suffering. And we can't measure the weight of suffering in, in terms of um, something that's quantifiable, it may be qualifiable, might be a better way to say it. Uh, I sort of look at numbers, and this may not be a fair comment, but um, what, the 5,000 vets, and I will talk about the even adults as well, but it, not to mitigate its importance, but it, it sort of becomes a footnote on a page, in a chapter, in a book, in a volume of a series or a set that's on a shelf in a library, right? I forget where I've heard that. I didn't come up with it, I'm not, but I borrowed that from somebody. Um, and that's what it's like, again, not to mitigate the numbers, but when we get in and we find out what's happened to these children, both while they were alive and the tragedy is even after they were dead, what happened, um, it speaks much more volumes. So um, then when I get, I'll get into what I call procedures and procedures would be, um, it's right now, and I might rename that topic, but it's a, it, it's a whole, it's a menu of a few different things. And uh, it's a menu of um, the development of the language, right? The Nazis were really big about developing a language to fit their goals and objectives. It started here. Okay. It happened here. Um lies and the cover-up a lot of these doctors had the pseudonyms okay that's a second name to cover things up um, the other thing is uh, that I do is the method of killing and uh, in particular I focus on the starvation diet for the children and um, what you have some doctors that would boast about these diets Right, that they created that would bring about 
certain death and would bring it about a certain time. And that would also cause, see, the, the thing is, it's really interesting. It's not so much dying of starvation. It's complications from starvation or complications from medicine. A big One of the largest would be tuberculosis, right? But what I did in, with some, for some research is I sort of went an uncon what I consider an unconventional way to go about the study uh, from, from additional comments because we have that one the one set of doctors here okay but there were a group of another doctors 28 Jewish doctors in the in the walls of the Warsaw ghetto um, and they wrote this book called hunger disease and you probably can't see it with the glare right called hunger disease and what is phenomenal you've got the perpetrators on one side and them, these 28 doc physicians, doctors, as victims on the other side, because what was happening, that book contains a fragmentary account of an incomplete, because of the dynamics of being in a ghetto during a wartime, uh, not having trained people, and you know, you got the, you know, you're in the threat and the war and food, but, but they are experiencing and going through the exact same type of death that they're writing about. I don't know if that's ever been done before. The author, does, uh, the editor doesn't believe it's ever been done before. Uh, it's just a phenomenal thing. And to hold that up against uh, the perpetrators to me was was very humbling. And it's it really is another way of, of keeping the memory of these 28 physicians um, um, in front of people. Uh, about uh, 20 of them, 70% died. Um, one we don't know about and a few survived. So I, I do get into that. Then I do get into other medical experiments, not the Auschwitz type experiments, but, but uh, or place, but uh, some other experiments that were going on. Again, I mentioned the brain research, and then um, some other ones with the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and um, people. I mean, almost it's almost as if these children were, were being harvested just to supply these uh, institutes with something to work on. All right. So that is, um, you know, I talked kind of went through how I'm starting with, with this and where I'm going, the memory in the beginning, a little bit about the perpetrators, uh, the ideology, um, the procedures, and also within the procedures, uh, there'll be some mention on how this euthanasia program really evolved into the children's euthanasia program. You have the adult T4 program, right? Then we move into the four, action 14 F13, and then we finally get into the final solution, right? So you can see them. And I've yet to read one scholar that has disagreed with this uh, with this progression about what happened. And when I talk about that, uh, we'll also talk, I'll talk, bring up some similarities between what we see happening, collecting gold out of the teeth, uh, the deportation, whatever mode that it happened to be in at the time, signing people, filling forms out, marking people, the lies. Um, and so it's, it's really an incredible study. Then I conclude with um, another section on memory and identity. So I bring it back around to memory. Right? That's sort of the bookends I talk about. Excuse me. And um, uh, what I'll, I'll do for that is I'll talk about the exhibit that the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Deadly Medicine um, exhibit, which I believe opened up in the spring of, yes, yeah, 2004 it opened up. And, and then uh, some other international uh, uh, memorials, okay, memorial sites that were that were set up, and some of the results that uh, they're having. It's it's phenomenal what's working. But um, in the course of this study, something else um, struck me. Um, a couple of things: identity. Some of the uh, cognitive uh, able developmentally, I mean, uh, adults, right today almost don't have an identity or a place compared to people with physical disabilities. See, there's this really interesting dynamic taking place. It sort of reminds me of, uh, what was the article we read by uh, uh, Makamana and Collins about the young virgin girl in Rwanda, or girls uh, who were raped, and all of a sudden, where do they fit? 
Their bodies really aren't that of a woman. They're, and they're not. Um, and they're no longer virgins. And they lose a lot of identity. Wh where do they go? And who are they? And so we see that even today in another segment of society uh, with the disabled people. And I think that's an interesting dynamic. I would like to explore more of that, maybe develop some comments with that in the paper. Um, then I have another part about the identity that will lead me into a discussion I didn't even think I would include, but I felt as though I had to. And I've got to use it for some reason. And it's what happened... Uh, it's a, the, the thalidomide child. If you're not familiar with thalidomide, it was a drug that was developed in Germany. It was used in the 50, late 50s and the 1960s as a drug for uh, women who were pregnant for morning sickness to help them with that feeling of, of nausea. But what happened is they were finding that um, what the little, what happens is drug cause was a, a underdeveloped uh, of longer bones within children. So you've get, um, let me, um, hold on for a second. Um, yeah, it's the absence or shortening of the long bones or extremities. And um, there's some stuff really unique about that because what ha what's shown in this study goes completely counter against the Nazi program of euthanasia. Okay. Um, and uh, and I was reading, I remember reading um, Robin Charlie Carpenter uh, recently for, for our class. And she talks about how important identity is. It's a crucial need for small children being appropriated in some form of social or political community. And then she talks about um, you know, studies on children who are not spoken to, entertained, held, or given attention, right? I mean, they, they show an, just an enormity of develop, developmental issues um, and how it affects these children. And she um, references the whole article written by uh, Mary Ainsworth, um, the effects of, uh, uh, of uh, maternal uh, deprivation, published in 1962, World Health Organization, um, at a conference in Geneva. And um, there are some things in that article, uh, and you know, taking a cue from what Carpenter said, you know, as um, as the trigger for me personally, and the, um, also the effects of what with these thalidomide um, children. There was a study done in Canada, which I will use in sight. Uh, that was about I think twenty eight subjects, and um, it goes counter to what people would, th would think. And how they respond and know and follow and want to be with people and it's not just their mothers but they draw a bond and an attachment with anyone that would make contact with them and there's some it's a really moving stories in there uh, but and which is great on an emotional level but it's also great on an intellectual level in terms of it just crushes that pseudo-scientific approach that the Nazis had for their race ideology. And I, there's a lot I think we can apply today um, because it's there might be some similar things to look at in terms of, well, how are we treating other cultures? And, you know, how, what are we saying about, uh, you know, the different genre, uh, roles of, of gender? And um, where are we in all this? And, you know, it could be even as simple as, it's our relationship like with our neighbors, right? Let me say it, my relationship with my neighbors. So I wanted to walk you through the outline. I thank you for your time. I know this is such an incredible amount of stuff we've got to do here in a few short days. We've got 10 days before the final papers do. So I thank everybody, and especially uh, Dr. Marlowe. This was really a great exercise because what I'm finding I was doing as I'm putting together the outline is that my paper is coming together more. And it's really a good filter for me to filter out a lot of stuff. And it's a good place for me to come. And it's very cathetic for me to speak here uh, because 
I don't have a place to go where I can share this to. As much as I love my dog, she's not going to listen. And uh, my wife and children, as much as I love them and admire them, that it's very difficult for, for them to connect with it. So anyway, have a wonderful time. If I don't uh, see any, or talk to anybody again, um, have a wonderful Christmas uh, and a great uh, Hanukkah as well. Thank you very much.